Shalom and welcome to today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Thank you very, very much for joining us. If you'd like to contact us for ideas, suggestions, just email me at Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com. Com, visit us on the website, jewishsacredaging.com, or the visit us on the Facebook page, Jewish Sacred Aging on Facebook. Um, as all of us know, we are in the middle of, let's just say, some very interesting and challenging times for the Jewish community in a variety of different ways. And one of the organizations that has uh, really come again to the forefront is a, a very, very traditional uh, organization seeped in Jewish history called Hyas. And we are very, very pleased and honored to welcome to today's edition of Seekers of Meeting, Rabbi Sarah Bassin, who is the Director of Clergy and Congregations for Hyas, based in Washington, D.C. Sarah, welcome. Welcome to Seekers of Meeting. Thank you for your time, and uh, especially in the middle of this crazy time, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm very happy to see you. Um, talk to me. Well, first of all, let's let's get the basics out of the way. Uh, there may be one or two people in the community who may be watching this or listening to it who may not be familiar with HIAS. What is it? When was it established? What does it do? Well, thank you so much for having me. I mean, especially in this moment. Um, most people are familiar with HIAS, but few people are familiar with the trajectory that the organization um, has taken in recent years. So. I'll take a moment and just share with you where we came from and where we are now and where it is that we're going. So Hyas was founded well over a century ago. We're not entirely sure about the exact year because many organizations have molded and folded into Hyas over time. But we were founded as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society to help welcome Jews to the United States who were fleeing persecution mainly coming from Eastern Europe and, and the waves of mass immigration of Jews in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, over the years, we helped Jews to come to the United States fleeing many different crises from the Holocaust um, to persecution in Iran um, to the waves of uh, Soviet immigration, right, after the, the free Soviet Jewry movement. Um, but what folks are less familiar about Hayes in recent years is that even after these final waves of Jewish immigration have occurred, we still continue to exist, just taking and leveraging the knowledge and expertise that we've built in serving the Jewish community over the last century and leveraging it for other populations who are also fleeing persecution and in search of safety and refuge. Um, you know, the tagline at Hyas is that uh, we used to help refugees because they were Jewish. Now we help refugees because we are Jewish. You know, unfortunately, both statements are actually true right now, and I'm sure we'll We'll speak about that, but Hyas at this point, we are in 24 different countries around the globe, everywhere from um, throughout Latin America, helping with the migrant crisis um, in this hemisphere. Um, but we were also on the ground uh, in Ukraine and ready to respond to the both internal displacement there, helping people resettle in Europe. We are in Chad, right along the Sudanese border, where uh, crisis broke out there again last year. Not as much global attention paid there, but in all of these places, Hyas has had a footprint for years and years. And that when crisis emerges, um, we're able to take that core infrastructure that we have and to leverage it to respond to the needs of people who are displaced, regardless of their backgrounds. And we are tremendously proud to be able to do that as a Jewish organization. So for somebody who wants to connect or learn more real fast, we'll do this up front too. The website, what, what is it? The website is highest.org. Um, and there is a section both on um, offering donations if you are so moved, but also there's a whole how to help section. Okay. So let's get right to, you know, cause you alluded to it and eventually 
Talk to me about Hayes's work now uh, in light of the the contemporary crisis in the Middle East and in, in Israel and Gaza. Yeah. Um, Hayes has had an office in Israel since, you know, around the founding of the state. And in recent years, it's always been dedicated towards um, helping the most vulnerable po- populations within Israeli society. In recent years, that has meant helping the Eritreans and Sudanese asylum seekers. It has meant helping Palestinian people from the LGBTQ community seeking refuge. It has meant helping Ukrainians, right, who have have fled for safety. Um, but as was true with the Ukrainian crisis, as was true with our, our structure in Chad, the fact that we had an office there ready and um, populated it has become a core foundation for responding to the many thousands of internally displaced Israelis who are coming in from the northern border with Lebanon, um, who are fleeing from the uh, Gaza envelope from those areas that are in greatest area of conflict. So Hyas is both deeply committed to our humanitarian principles of helping people regardless of their background. And it is also true that sometimes we as Jews are in need of that humanitarian help ourselves. And um, that core infrastructure is really what enabled us to be able to step up our emergency response and meet the moment. So for so for example, how many people highest workers are on? Do you, do you know? I mean, this may may not you may not know this uh, on the ground in Israel helping and have more people come into Israel to help with highest? Yeah, I, I think our Israel office um, is around 20 people uh, in, you know, quote unquote, normal times. Um, but whenever we have an emergency response, we have a whole slate of people internal to the organization um, that are ready for deployment and are leveraged depending on their skills. So we're still in the midst of that core, like early identifying of skills, needs on the ground and what that deployment will actually look like. Um, but over recent years, unfortunately, by virtue of necessity, we have really leaned into the emergency response um, uh, part of our mission. It, it, is the office in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? I'm honestly not sure about the, uh, the core location. And if somebody may be watching or listening to this and say, I, you know, I've heard about this is something I want to do. Can they go on highest.org and connect with the appropriate people? Or is it or is there a separate means of communication on on this? Well, there is a way to donate directly to the highest Israel um, response uh, to segment out and to make sure that your donation is is funneled um, to our office work there. Um, but you know, a, a, a major part of humanitarian response is understanding what is helpful and what is good intention that might not also be quite as effective. So, um, you know, we've had tremendous love and outpouring and offers for a variety of different things. Um, but frankly speaking, the most important thing, um, that's needed on the ground is the money that is going to be able to be leveraged by the local partners um, who really understand what the needs are rather than flooding with a particular, um, you know, good or service. uh, The the donations ensure that we're able to most effectively leverage the help. So if I'm sitting in my house and I hear this and I think this is something I I, I would like to get on a plane and, and, and go help, what, what I'm hearing you say is, we we have things under control. It's easier for you to donate, you know, fifty dollars. That will go more than us trying to orient you, train you, get you there and and back, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. My- part of a sophisticated emergency response is having the slate of people who are pre trained, ready to go, and um, able to be deployed. So there's not that lag time, um, and you know, trying to discern. Can we exactly fit and meet this need? I mean, time time is almost always of of the essence. So, um, highest is not in a place where we uh, deploy people external to the organizations. 
It might be the case that if you are a, you know, a doctor, a doctor or a trauma expert, that there are organizations that can there do are, that. Right. There are. Right. But that's, that's not what Hyas does. No, I, 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 I wanted to make, make sure people understood that and because, you know. Yeah. I, and, and again, it's not, um, out of a desire to restrict people. But oh, no, this no, is, no. It's, yeah. um, it's safety and efficiency of running and getting the most help to the most people. Uh, in the quickest way. Um, I mean, even even just for some of the work that I've done, which haven't hasn't even been in in the direct service capacity. But when I've um, when I've gone on border delegations or these these trips on behalf of Hyas as a staff person, I've had to do something like twenty five hours worth of uh, security training, right? Let alone the actual training to provide direct service. So. How do you reach out to congregations? I mean, your your job as a director of clergy and congregations for highest. Let me let me ask you about that specifically because there may be some colleagues who say, "Well, you know something? Let me get a hold of this uh, colleague to maybe do something at the congregation or have a program." How do you interface with congregations around around North America, or or, or is it just the United States? Um, it is North America um, and increasingly globally. There are some parts that we have a more sophisticated infrastructure, specifically in the United States. I would say our advocacy work, um, it, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, policy advocacy and leveraging congregations um, to advocate to the government on behalf of the Jewish community is more specifically a U.S. based endeavor at this point. Um, but we are rapidly expanding. So that might be evolving and changing in the coming years. At this point, Hyas has some kind of relationship, um, meaning that congregations have done something at some point with Hyas, with about 900 Jewish congregations across the country and across all denominations. So this could mean that congregations have done something as small as sign up for our welcome campaign, right? Which is a simple declaration of values that indicates that they support refugees and asylum seekers and roots that in Jewish values. Um, we encourage congregations to do that and to kind of leverage that as an internal congregational co conversation starter, right, on the work that they want to do more in this space. Um, so that's kind of on the easy, low-hanging fruit end to advocacy work, right, really sophisticated lobbying. Um, either as a congregation or as part of a national effort, um, and then direct resettlement work. I mean, one of the most beautiful things to witness is when a congregation comes together to welcome an individual refugee family or, you know, the Afghans and um, Ukrainians didn't come here as refugees, technically in their categorization. They came here under the program of humanitarian parole, but nevertheless, receive the same kind of welcome and help from congregations where, you know, a core team of five to seven people really does a lot of the work and in interfacing with these families to help them restart their lives after unfathomable trauma and upending yeah. their worlds. I, and, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, you know, but what's, what's even more beautiful about a congregation is that it doesn't just rely on those five to seven people. They can draw from the expertise and the resources that the full congregation, that maybe there's a property owner who's able to help find, um, you know, a, a low rent place for them to stay for a year or a dentist who's willing to do some dental work that they hadn't had access to in Afghanistan, Right. So it's it's just incredible what congregations are able to do um, in terms of helping and supporting a resettling family. No, I want to validate because the congregation that I served in and now teaching a lot at, um, Cole and me in Southern New Jersey, along with other, uh, did this. And I had a core, had the whole committee involved with the resettlement of this family, a multi-generational family, actually. And they did exactly what you said. They, they got a hold of resources in the congregation, uh, for housing, support, uh, training, ESL stuff. And it really, I, I just was over there, uh, a while ago. It really works. I mean, so if, 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 if a colleague or a 
your social action people are listening to this or watching this, please get a hold of Highest because this is a a can be a transformational program for many people in a congregation who may not be, you know, I'm not going to services every Friday night, but I'm touched by this need and I can do direct service and really help another human because it is you're helping one other human being and maybe a family uh, in, as uh, Sarah is talking about, unbelievable uh, catastrophe and horror in some in some cases. Yeah, I actually I did this with um, before my role at Highest when I served as a congregational rabbi, kind of the last thing I did in that congregational role in terms of justice work was setting up the resettlement of, of an Afghan family um, and putting together the team within our congregation and within uh, another congregation. So I got to experience it on, on both ends um, and to understand even how far in the last two years Hyas has come in terms of the sophistication of what we've been able to offer congregations. You know, with Afghanistan, it was a whole new world of reopening privatized resettlement, right? This, this notion that it's not the agency that takes the lead on resettling the family, that it's civilians who take the lead on resettling the family with the support, right, of, of highest on the side, the resources and the expertise that we have built up to be able to support folks, um, both through the Afghan crisis, then through the Ukrainian crisis and this program is only expanding with the Biden administration's announcement of the Welcome Corps, which is basically creating a parallel track in the United States to the main refugee program that, you know, Biden has announced will attempt to resettle 125,000 refugees annually by HIAS and the nine other agencies that contract with the government. Um, but a parallel track has opened up for individual civilians to come in and to take the lead in this work, which just expands our national capacity to bring more people to safety and to refuge. And Hyas wants to help people who want to do that work. So you, you alluded to before, um, not only the crisis in Gaza and Israel, um, but uh, and your work in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. But the southern border of the United States, which is, um, no one has to, you know, go too much, too much detail as it's in the news just about every single day. Is highest involved down uh, in the southern border? You mentioned the fact that you have contacts and are working in Central America with the migrants. Is, is there a highest presence? Are you involved in that at all? Deeply. Um, first of all, highest has a, a very robust presence throughout Latin America. Um, you know, the, the number of countries that we are throughout the LAC region, Latin America and the Caribbean is, is really astonishing with multiple offices, um, in Mexico alone, helping these migrants as, as they're making their, and asylum seekers as they're making their journey north. In the United States, the way that this translates is that we do a lot of advocacy around border policy that impacts the situation and the conditions for migrants. So, you know, separate from this podcast, you want to have me back on and I could give you a primer of how we've evolved from Title 42 under the Trump administration to the asylum ban under the Biden administration. It's it's really astonishing how so many of the same policies get recycled under different nomenclature um, and under different administrations. Um, but essentially what we're dealing with is, is a, a lack of political will. Um, not an actual numbers crisis. One of the, the kind of most astonishing numbers that I've seen is that even as we're dealing with this influx and, and, uh, New York is overrun and you see all these, these images, the, the, tra the rate right now of migrants coming to the United States, the immigration rate is 2.748 per 1,000 people. Okay. Just follow me on this technical bit for a second. 2.748 for 1,000 people in 2023. So that means that, you know, for every 1,000 people that exist in the United States, 2.748 are coming in. If you compare this to other historical moments in the United States, that number was 6.8 in 1998. That number was 10.4 between 1900 and 1914. 
So this is not a crisis of proportion that our country has never seen the likes of before, right? What's different in this moment now is the paralyzation of our institutions to respond. And highest actually, you know, as deeply as we are driven by religious values of safety and welcome, we are remarkably pragmatic. We're not an organization that says, open the border, right? Let's have, let's have no borders. Let's have a utopia. All we're asking for is a boring, functional bureaucracy, right? That can handle the backlog that has built up as the political will has continued to diminish. So, um, a lot of our advocacy work uh, identifies some of the specific policies that are imposing the deepest harm, and you can find those on on the website. Um, but I'm sad to say that this is something that is not based on your political affiliation, right or left. It might have gotten more attention under the previous administration than this one, um, but this is something that we're struggling with across the political spectrum of building the political will for. Sarah, what are people afraid of in this conversation what, that you're talking about? What are people afraid of? And I got to ask the question because it's just there, you know, and how much of it is racial in your opinion? What are people afraid of? I, I will say there's an amazing book by um, an author, Hasia Diner, on immigration in America that basically traces the tension throughout American history of both our identity being fully built on immigration and the pride that we take on that um, combined with intense xenophobia. So it takes us a generation to like the immigrants that came before while we're focused on the immigrants who are coming now and are very nervous and afraid of them and use the same tropes as, you know, they're lazy, they don't work hard, they're a drain on um, public resources, right? All of that rhetoric has simply been recycled throughout American history with different moments of fever pitch high and a relatively low level hum, right? But it's been present throughout our history. And in terms of the racial component, I, I mean, Ukrainians, there was a program created for Ukrainians, right? Uniting for Ukraine in order to help those folks come for safety and refuge. Highest absolutely supported that. We got behind it. <coughs> we leverage congregations throughout the country to help resettle Ukrainians. Um, more than 100,000 Ukrainians were able to come in through that program. It is not lost on a lot of people who have been waiting in line for many, many years, the ethnic makeup of that particular population and how that avenue was opened and those applications were processed within days or weeks when others have been waiting for years. And there often happens to be a very high correlation um, between the racial or ethnic country of origin. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the historical thing too. I remember, I mean, I'm from Philly and born and raised here and we, you know, we don't, we don't teach history, but there were riots in Philadelphia in the 1800s during the uh, uh, Irish immigration, New York as well. Um, and the same, as you say, tropes were, but it, it's all there. We don't teach it and we don't, we don't, because nobody teaches history anymore. So th this uh, motif throughout his American history is something, again, um, people need to hear about. So, I, I, I'm yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it is amazing how consistent it is, right? The, the British didn't like the Germans when the Germans came in, then the, the Germans came in, you know, they, they didn't like the Irish and then the Irish didn't like, it, it just keep pushing it forward. And, and so many of the policies initially that started to restrict immigration were explicitly racially based from the Chinese Exclusion Act in the late 19th century, right? That was the first one that was, it has it in its name, right? And then in 1924, the um, 
the immigration acts that basically establish quotas and that subsequently severely limited access for Jewish immigration. There's a reason why the uptick in Jewish immigration was from the 1880s to the 1920s and then drastically dropped and why we had such difficulty getting to the United States leading up to the Holocaust. And it was from Herculean efforts from organizations like Hyas and others that, you know, they worked within the systems that they had. They bought up every open seat on any ship that was coming um, to get people to to the country, but they were fighting against increasingly narrow narrowing pathways. And that's what we're seeing at the southern border right now. You'll hear people talk about, well, why don't they come in the right way? There's no right way to come in anymore, or 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 that is almost it is it is it is such a bottleneck that has siphoned off that it's more it's better to compare it to the lottery than it is to an ash, actual immigration pathway. So Hyas, Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, is Jewish, as you mentioned. Its foundation is based upon Jewish values. And as you mentioned, it's shifted. We do this now because we're Jewish. And as you outlined brilliantly, offices all around the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, working on the southern border, et cetera, et cetera. Has there been any reaction to Jewish? the um, Hebrew in the name, the Jewish overlay. Is there any reaction that you're aware of as we, as, as you're dealing with the immigrant populations around the world? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take this from a few different angles. So first of all, we were the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society. We are now um, HIAS, right? We have intentionally just become known as the acronym itself. Um, and dropped the words behind it, not unlike, you know, the NAACP and in part because the, the nomenclature is, is no longer of, of the era, but also to reflect that it's no longer accurate that we just serve a particular population. It also, you know, for, for engaging with so many populations who have had no prior exposure to Jews. Right. We have an office set up in Greece that primarily was there to um, help Syrian refugees. Right. This is not a population that has a lot of lived experience with the Jewish community. Right. You think about their first encounter with Jews being the organization that welcomes them and helps them on their first steps to what's next in their life. Right, coming off those boats to safety and security. The journey is by no means over. Right. That is some unbelievable PR for our community. If you're thinking about it from just a really pragmatic uh, standpoint, but we don't lead with screaming to the world that Ayas is Jewish. Right. It's, it's more subtle in part because the thing that's most important to us is that we do the work and we do the work well, right? And um, as a humanitarian organization, we're really committed to the principles behind what that means, which is that the work is at the forefront, not the religiosity behind it. Um, we want to make sure that people know that we're not there to proselytize, that we don't have some form of alternative mission <clears throat> on what we're doing with them. And the good work speaks for itself. But, you know, I am not aware of any Afghans or Ukrainians. Like, that's the population that I've had the most exposure work uh, with based on the kind of congregational work we've done. I'm not aware of any that have declined to be helped because we are a Jewish organization. And, and I will say a number of congregations kind of express concern of, are we going to be encountering or dealing with anti-Semitism? You know, the question could also be asked of, of Ukrainians. There's, there's some fairly deep uh, anti-Semitism within in Ukrainian society for God, Jewish Ukrainians that were getting settled. But We've had these really beautiful moments in, in recent weeks where I've heard about how um, the folks that uh, synagogues have welcomed from the Afghan community have been reaching out 
to the Jews in the synagogues that helped them and asked them how they were in the aftermath of October 7th, right? Just to check on it, check in on them. And like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that, how powerful that is. These Afghans certainly did not have a relationship with the Jewish community beforehand. Now, look, the, the family that we, that my old congregation is working with from the Ukraine, as you pointed out so eloquently, um, politics, it's irrelevant. It's human being, human being, I need help. You've helped me. I'm eternally grateful. And on a very, very fundamental relationship level, that's how you change. Look, that's how you really do, do change the world. I, you know, I so, I, my whole career has been in this kind of interrelational world. And I have dealt with many an accusation of, you know, naivete or rose colored glasses. The scientific research is there, right? That the contact theory, these intimate personal relationships, that that is actually the strongest way to combat prejudice, yeah. period. And uh, given the state of the world, we probably could use a lot more rose-colored glasses uh, than uh, AR-15s. Worst things and, to be accused of, yeah. Yeah, that should be the worst thing. Uh, Sarah Basson, Rabbi Sarah Basson, Director of Clergy and Congregations for HIAS. Thank you very, very much for sharing the story of HIAS real fast. Again, somebody wants to get in touch with you, make a donation, ask, learn more about it. They go to? HIAS.org, HIAS.org. Um, and there are links both for getting involved, how to help, and how to donate. Rabbi Basson, thank you very, very much. Continued success. Stay healthy. Good luck. Take care of yourself. And um, hope we encounter each other on the road there sometime at some place. But continue. Good luck. Great work. Thank you for the mitzvah. Thank you to so all much of for you. having me. Our pleasure. Believe me. Thank you very much for all of you who've joined us today. We do appreciate you being with us. Um, if you are interested in becoming a sponsor of some of these podcasts, please email me, rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. If you are generous enough to make a do tax free donation to help support our work in these podcasts, if you go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and click on the conveniently located donate button, just follow the prompts. It's really, really, really easy. Uh, Secrets of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out to our genius producer, Steve Lubetkin. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. I thank you very, very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the next Secrets of Meaning podcast and TV show from Jewish Sacred Aging. In the meantime, just stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. And be kind to one another. Shalom. <laughs>